Hey everyone, it's MJ here with Alex Storm, and we're getting ready to talk spoilers for Furious 7. So as usual, if you haven't seen the movie, go check it out, come back and watch our video. So Alex, we just watched Furious 7. What are your thoughts on this movie? I thought um, the action was amazing. <laughs> the bus scene, I was in awe. Um, Paul Walker is pretty cool. I thought they did a good job of hiding the fact that he's dead. I've, wow, okay. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Like, having very little memory of all the Furious movies um, and not knowing him very much as an actor outside of those, I didn't find it very noticeable when they were, you know, doing things to, to cover up that he wasn't actually there. And I loved Michelle Rodriguez's character. She was super badass. And, yeah, overall... I enjoyed it. Um, it's ridiculous. There's n the story. You don't need to pay any attention to the story. You really just go see this movie for the action. What did you think? Yeah, I guess we'll go piece by piece. Uh, I want to address the Paul Walker thing later in the discussion. But for now, we'll just start like the basic concept behind the story for this film. You know, so in Fast and Furious 6, uh, the main bad guy is this British dude played by Luke Evans. Don't ask me to recall the plot line of any of these movies. I can't remember any of them, I'm, and I, I think I'm not supposed to. But long story short, their crew ends up killing him. But except that he's not dead in the beginning of this movie, too, which is kind of weird. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, Jason Statham, his older brother, comes because he's mad and he's going to get revenge against Dom and his family, right? So the premise is decent, I guess. In, in some ways, this is actually one of the few like direct sequels in the franchise where it's you know directly stemming from something that happened in the previous film. Um, one of the things I want to talk about was the fact that The Rock is only in basically three scenes in the movie for all intents and purposes. He's in the beginning, he gets injured, he disappears for the entire movie, comes back at the end. I was a little disappointed by the, the lack of Rocky action in this film. Um, other than that, the pl plot and the storyline is just a clusterfuck, as always. <laughs> I have no idea why. Something about a Ramsey and a God's Eye and a something or another, and, and it's just a reason to get them to go to freaking Abu Dhabi and fly some cars into some other buildings and stuff. So, which is always you know, cool. Like, I mean, I think for a stick, as much of a stickler as I can be for uh, competent stories. Uh, there's nothing competent about this story at all. It, it, the one-liner is absolutely ridiculous throughout the entire thing. Uh, some of the comedy is hit or miss. Kurt Russell shows up, you know, for the first time in this franchise and totally just, I mean, delivers some of the most <laughs> ridiculous, ridiculous lines that I can even imagine. And somehow, with all that being said, the movie still works for me. It, it, it's still yeah. like, you know, when you go to pay whatever you're paying at your local theater to go see a movie. You want to walk away satisfied and entertained, ultimately. And I, I can't really imagine anyone going to see this movie and being like, oh man, that, that, that was boring, or that sucked, yeah. or I didn't enjoy myself. I, I completely agree. Um, by far, my favorite part was all the action. Um, and Ramsey, her character being a girl, I thought was cool. Yeah. At first, when, they reali when I realized she was a girl, I was disappointed. So I was like, oh man, of course they're rescuing some chick in this. <laughs> and I was bummed. But then... Um, she she didn't turn out to be super typical, and the fact that she was the computer geek of the group was cool. I, I like that. Um, it was funny how she just fell right in with them and was yeah. like, you know, being thrown <laughs> like, between cool. cars, and, and then was like in the final scene, like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm buddies with yeah. you guys now. I'm here with your like you and your family. Yeah, part of the family. Yeah. Out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Kurt Russell. He's so old. He's so funny. <laughs> like, I don't know what the last movie I saw him in, but I loved him. He was entertaining <laughs> to me. I was cracking up to, like, with him the whole time. Yeah, I don't know, man. I, I thought he was all right. I mean, I, I didn't feel like he was a standout character for his, like, I feel like he's playing a version of a character that's been in, like, every action movie that's come out in the past few mm -hmm. years where it's, like, yeah. the older guy who's... Yeah coming with some plot or whatever. Yeah. And so, I mean, it was just his turn, He's you just... know, slot Kurt Russell into mm -hmm. it. And that's fair, you know. But one of the things I will say is that I actually enjoyed more about this movie uh, than some of the more recent ones. You know, ever since they basically created the Avengers of Fast and Furious uh, with the fifth movie by bringing everyone, almost everyone from the franchise back, you know, Tyrese and Ludacris have, been big, have had bigger roles. And... This one seemed to me, if my memory serves me correctly, to be the biggest roles that either one of them have had. They just had the most dialogue. And I, I've always loved Tyrese's character. Going back, you know, he debuted in the franchise in the second movie. And I thought he was hilarious in that, you know. And 
pretty much anytime he shows up, he cracks me up, which is cool because Tyrese is not a comedian in the strictest sense. The guy's a freaking R and B singer, you know. But his his character is not funny because he's a comedian. He's just so <laughs> dumb. But he still has. <laughs> but you have to have comedic timing yeah, to be able to be funny no, in a movie. No. So and his yeah, I like him. I yeah, like yeah, him. No, I, I love him. I am a little uh, sad that they dropped his uh, his subplot about him uh, eating a lot of food. They didn't really reference him <laughs> eating food in this movie. Maybe maybe for the eighth one, I guess. Um, but yeah, so I mean, again, like you can go action sequence by action sequence, but the one where Paul Walker is on the bus, like the the, the in, that entire that. sequence leading up to mm-hmm. that point was definitely the, the standout of the film. Um, of note is Tony Ja from the Ong Bak series and The Protector. He's in this movie as one of the henchmen. He doesn't get a lot of screen time, and I mean, if you've seen Ong Bak or The Protector, then you've definitely seen him do cooler things mm-hmm. <laughs> than what happens in this movie. But it was still cool to see him in America for the first time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he didn't really speak a lot of English, but but he had some pretty cool action yeah, sequences. Yeah, some cool flips. Yeah, some, some cool, cool fight flips. Moves. Yeah, and um, then um, but that oh, action right. sequence was so cool because they were in the forest. Like besides the <laughs> cars getting dropped out of a plane, <laughs> which was awesome <laughs> and ridiculous, over the top. But they're in the forest for all of it, and I don't know if they've done that like that extensive of a scene where they're driving through trees and all yeah, and yeah. I think that was, it was, it was yeah. what made it special. That was definitely it it something that flipped that that scene up from uh, typical Fast and Furious. So I mean, you know, the franchise has come so far. You know, the first movie was about an undercover cop infiltrating some. Well, I think they might have been drug dealers or whatever it was they were trying to figure out about Dom's, uh, you know, family and his crew, and it was so grounded. You know, it was almost like. Barely an action movie. It was really like almost dramatic in some ways. The second movie definitely had a lot more color. You know, I think John Singleton directed again, brought in Tyrese, made it a little more exciting. Too fast, too furious, all this mm-hmm. stuff. And a lot of people thought that was it for the franchise because they went to Tokyo Drift, didn't bring anyone back, and it was just a mess. Speaking of which, I think his name is Lucas Haas. I think it's his name, or is it Lucas Black? I don't know. But that dude, he pops up for one scene in this movie too because this, the timeline of this entire franchise is a little staggered. Like, this is actually the first movie that now sort of catches the franchise up to present day because when they did Tokyo Drift, the movie actually took a jump in time. Mm -hmm. So uh, the character of Han, you know, the fact that he died in the last film uh, meant that that movie actually took place before Tokyo Drift. So Tokyo Drift is sort of happening concurrently between some point between the end of part five and this movie right here. So there's still sort of a weird like timeline thing they're doing because they show uh, the older brother played by Statham visiting his brother. And then they almost, I guess they imply that he kills him within the, the timeline of this film, but you don't see him killing Han, right? Like, because they have the funeral and all that mm-hmm, stuff. So mm-hmm. so it's kind yeah. of a weird timeline thing going on between the last movie and this one and then Tokyo Drift. It's this weird, crazy thing. But again, long story short, as of right now, uh, every movie... For, with this franchise going forward, is sort of a new storyline uh, as far as the timeline is concerned, mm-hmm. which is, uh, I guess, interesting that they're their seventh movie and now they're finally moving forward with time. Um, so I don't know if there's anything you want to talk about. Well, you talk about Paul. What did you think? Well, no, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. The core of the movie, I was going to say before we get to, to, <laughs> yeah. to the Paul Walker stuff. So, yeah, so uh, I am especially sensitive to CGI in, in all of its forms. Uh, I've been diagnosed with a, a condition called CGI-tis. Um, so anytime I see it, I, I react to it. You know, it, it's very, uh, I'm very sensitive to it. And they did a really good job of, you know, sort of hiding uh, the scenes where Paul Walker wasn't actually on set shooting because of his unfortunate death. But there were a few standout moments where it was pretty clear that it wasn't him. Like, well, I, the first time I really noticed it was the scene where they blow up the house where it's a Jordana Brewster is out there with Vin Diesel and Paul Walker's putting the kid in the car and they're having that one-on-one conversation. And I guess any scenes like that in the movie were the ones I was particularly sensitive to because it's kind of weird to think about, but like the entire franchise, because Paul Walker is essentially the co-lead of this franchise, there aren't very many scenes in the, in the film where he's in the scene and he's not the focus of the scene or the mm-hmm. camera's on him. So it was odd that daddy's taking the kid to the car in this particular scene. And so all those shots of him walking from the house to the car to the van uh, and everything that happened after that that was like a transposed head on his body and it kind of stuck out to me mm-hmm. uh, and then there were a few other scenes later in the movie it seems like apparently almost all the scenes between him and Jordana Brewster hadn't been shot or something because it seems like almost every yeah. intimate scene between the two of them there was some weird editing or weird yeah. things going on where you, you could kind of tell that it wasn't actually Paul Walker there at the time yeah what did you think of the final sequence the very ending of the movie and I don't know them sending him off 
Yeah. Like I, making it, you know, sort of known. Like, of course, this guy's <laughs> not coming back, but without well, saying it. Well, I think it was interesting because it's like, within the context of the film, it still doesn't feel like they're making it like he's not coming back. Mm-hmm. And so it was, it was sort of this weird meta moment where it's sort of acknowledging reality. Except I kept thinking to myself, I guess most people who go to see this movie will be aware of the fact that Paul Walker is dead, but I know that there will be people who aren't. And I feel like they handled it very well, actually. I mean, it was very sentimental, very delicate, but I actually do wonder, even with it's like for Paul at the end, if some people, let's say a 12-year-old or something who isn't really familiar Mm -hmm. with the franchise, and maybe this is his first Fast and Furious movie, um, may actually not be aware of the fact that Paul Walker is dead in real life, you know? And maybe yeah. a little confused it, it, when yeah. the eighth movie comes out and he's not in it at all, you know? So, uh, yeah, that, that was kind of... Like, even there wasn't an in-loving memory of... You know, so mm-hmm. like, even when they cut to the credits, like, it was nothing that was like, okay. like yeah. this guy's dead, you know? Yeah. Or that they had, like, a, you know, uh, from this year to that, you know, to when he... Yeah, so I don't know. It, it was... I thought it was cool. I really liked the way they handled it. It was sentimental, and it kind of came right out of the, this, uh, you know, emotional moment for some audience mm-hmm. members where people thought that Dom might be dead. Of course, we, we knew he wasn't dead, but they they yeah. tugged on the heartstrings of some, and they you know they did a good job. Even adding in some never before seen scene of them getting married that was definitely not in any of the movie that I can remember. But you know, whatever <laughs> you got to make it happen. So. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, all in all, I thought it was a really good action movie. Definitely worth anyone's money. Um, if they're into action movies, especially if they're a 12-year-old boy. I love it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, actually, you know, there's one thing I want to do address, too, actually, because you said you liked Michelle Rodriguez's character yeah. because she was badass, and I've always enjoyed her character into Michelle Rodriguez in general because he's badass. Mm-hmm. But I did want to point out that they do a good job with the main women of making them empowered across the board mm-hmm. in this franchise, for the most part. Um, but at the same time, they have all these gratuitous shots of women's asses and their physiques in mm-hmm. other scenes. Like, it, it's this weird, like, I don't know, man. I, 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 get, I feel like I'm getting mixed messages from watching this movie. Yeah, you know, even the Ronda women. Rousey thing, you know? Yeah, yeah she, was, she was badass. And they show women, like, as being, like, dynamic whole people, the main mm-hmm. characters. And even the other women who were fighting Michelle Rodriguez in that scene, they weren't, they weren't sexy. They didn't look like yeah, um, women uniforms. that were there to yeah. be objectified. But there mm-hmm. is this whole other side where women are objectified in the movie. And it's, yeah, it's a contrast to the actual characters they build. Yeah, and it's not happening to dudes in the movie. I mean, mm-hmm. there aren't dudes running around with shirts off, you know, no. slathered in wax and stuff. So no. it's like, it's just it's really, it's like, Jarring and unnecessary, especially for the seventh movie in the franchise, mm-hmm. it's like, okay, they're having a lavish party, you mm-hmm. know, that the prince is having, so we have to see women in bikinis paid mm-hmm. in gold, you know? It's like, okay, cool, again, like, we know it's a street racing movie franchise, that's where it started, and mm-hmm. look, it was a different time when this franchise started as well, you know? Mm-hmm. Things have changed, so I will say, you know, bummer, but I felt like it was a bit excessive uh, at points. It's just unnecessary. It's unnecessary, yeah. yeah. The, movie, the movie was really great without it. Yeah, you it know? Was- Unnecessary added, I don't know, eye candy. Yeah. Um, but the coolest, aside from the bus scene, the coolest eye candy in the movie <laughs> was the, the scene that happened right after that, where they're jumping the car through the buildings. <laughs> I was also on the edge of my seat for that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so oh, cool. well, yeah, you know what? See, we, we, every time we think we're done, they pull us back in. One more thing I want to talk about is the just escalating superhuman nature <laughs> of all the characters in this franchise. You know, one of the standout moments from the last movie that had me laughing at the film hysterically was the scene where they're like on a bridge and the car's like flying in the air and Michelle Rodriguez jumps out of the car and Vin Diesel jumps out of the car and they catch each other in midair and they just fall on the ground and they're mm-hmm. good. Now Vin Diesel is lifting. He is a human jack. Okay? He just yeah. picked the car up. I was like, I had this moment in my mind where I was like, <laughs> after they went through all the specs of this car, talking about how amazing it was, and they also say that it was the lightest car ever created or something. <laughs> yeah, and this this like car weighs that? like this, this car weighs 300 pounds. You know, you can deadlift this thing by yourself. He just picked the car up. Like, and it was just so casual. Like, no one just yeah, thought anything of like, it. I got it. Yeah, it's like this yeah. super weird thing where it's like, <laughs> Even like you know, going back to Jason Statham's character, they they introduce him by showing a hospital that it looks like a fucking bomb hit it, and he's by himself. There are dudes just curled up in the corner, too scared. Uh, doctors. doctors like, oh no, you know, 
he just destroyed, he just laid to waste his entire place. And then in the last action scene, which is him fighting Vin Diesel by himself. Vin Diesel, who, again, the inception of this character, he's a guy who drives cars. That's what he does, okay? <laughs> he don't have no black ops training. He ain't got no taekwondo, no kung fu, no krog maga, none of that stuff, okay? <laughs> he's just a guy who drives cars. And now he's going toe-to-toe -to -toe with this dude. He's like, yeah, let me blast off my last sawed-off shotgun shell. Let's get it cracking. <laughs> And they yeah, go at it, and he's fighting. Yeah, and he basically, well, I would say he beats a guy, but he holds his match. own with a dude yeah. who they just said is the most dangerous exactly. thing, you know, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, again, you know, you just got to go with it. And if you do go with go it, you'll have fun. But further and further. Yeah, but I still say, again, I definitely was laughing at the film sometimes and not with it. But even still, you know, there's some magical uh, recipe that the Fast series has managed to put together that just makes it work. And I guess before we go, one last thing I wanted to address is James Wan, the director. So this guy, you know, he did Insidious 1 and 2. He created and directed the first Saw movie, Dead Silence. He's pretty much only done horror movies. You know, he did The Conjuring as well. And so this is his first huge, you know, action blockbuster film. And for a horror director, a guy who's primarily known as a horror director, he did a great job, right? I mean, he I feel like you would job. you would never know that this guy's expertise was horror films. Like, mm -hmm. it's just like, I mean, it seemed completely seamless. Yeah. Like, it felt like a Fast and Furious movie. It didn't yeah. seem like something that was just out of control. You know what I'm oh. saying? I mean, that, that, that he was out, out of his uh, realm of skill or, or whatever he's it's, capable of. It's so different from all those other movies because it is so fast-paced. It's not, like, slow with story building and, like, setting up shots. It's all <laughs> super fast in this movie. And, yeah, I thought he did awesome. I would have never guessed that he didn't direct action movies. Yeah, yeah. So there you have it, folks. I think that's going to conclude our discussion of Furious 7. Uh, as always, you guys can follow me at the only MJ on Twitter. And you can follow her at Alex Storm TMT. There you go. As in themoderntruth.com, which is where you can find all the latest news, videos, and commentary on anything you could possibly be concerned about. Um, as always, guys, have a good time and let us know what you think in the comments. Take care.